Really nice to see you all here. And I have no doubt that the attractive force is a very, very special guest that we have this evening. And I'll introduce Ian shortly. How many of you have read the book, The Day of the Triffids? Okay, some of you have. By the way, if you've got cell phones on, I always say keep them on. And some of you know the reason why I say that, because that way I can tell what it is about your well-chosen jingle that represents you, and I have a better sense of what my audience is. But I'm not the speaker tonight, and maybe my speaker tonight will not appreciate it as much, so maybe out of courtesy you put it on silence. <laughs> the day of the Triffids, when the plants took revenge against humans. Those of you who like dystopia, it's called, which is the opposite of utopia, then that is a wonderful little text. Why do I raise it in this particular format? Because one of the absolutely wondrous aspects of human life is we actually consume things. We take things from the outside in our environment, we put it into our bodies and it becomes part of us. I don't know if anyone really sat back and thought, what an absolutely strange thing that is. I mean, communication with each other, we don't consume each other, we enter into warm, wonderful relationships, and sometimes less so, but nevertheless, we don't consume each other as such. But when it comes to the animal kingdom, when it comes to the plant kingdom, and even the inanimate, we actually take that put it in our mouths and make it part of us. And Torah and Hasidus has a lot to say about the ethics of doing that. And basically says, you shouldn't. What gives you, the human being, the right to destroy one of the other kingdoms? What gives you the right to actually kill the life force of a plant or an animal? Simply because we're human, we have the power, we have the capacity, or egocentrically, we need to. Need dictates how we behave. That surely isn't a very moral stand. And the truth of the matter is, you should not eat. Really, if you're a moral person, you should not eat, because you have no right to kill a plant. In Jewish spiritual teachings, a plant possesses a soul, an animal possesses a soul, even the stone possesses a soul. Not that you eat stones, nevertheless. So it's really a very real question which people generally don't ask themselves. And tonight we're not going to discuss the response, the answer. At least I'll give you a one-liner so you have a sense of satisfaction. When you eat mindfully, with a kavana, which means conscious intention, to borrow the soul energy of the food, which then translates into your own body energy. And then, as you express it in your everyday life, through behavior, through words, if you do this to elevate around you people, the world, you elevate the spiritual energy of the food to a higher plane. However, if you go out into the world and hurt and degrade, destroy, then you're actually stealing the soul spark of the food and imprisoning it. I won't go further into the Kabbalistic teaching within there, but it means that every one of us must eat morally by eating consciously and mindfully, knowing that we are borrowing the soul spark, and therefore it's incumbent upon us to go out into the world and use the energy wisely. One of the aspects of wise use of that borrowing is to maintain the well-being of the body. The body is the medium through which our true inner self the seat of consciousness expresses through. And therefore, it's an absolute mitzvah to maintain health and wellness. 
and there must be rules to that as there are in all aspects of the design of the cosmos. There are rights and there are wrongs. And tonight we have an illustrious guest, somebody who I've had the very good fortune to know now for well over a decade, if not longer, and his wonderful wife, Dr. Ruth Gawler, who's here, on previous occasions, she has presented also. She's piked out on this occasion. But don't worry, I'll catch up with you, Ruth. And Ian, I think, is pretty much a household name. He's been of such great assistance to so many, so inspirational to so many. And under those circumstances, we at Spirit Grow are very privileged that he has come and joined us here, as he does now once a year, to share of that wisdom, to share of the experience, to share of the challenge that he faced, and thank God for decades has overcome. And in so doing, hopefully we will leave this room a much better equipped individual to know how we should consume food, when and what. Thank you, Ian. Good evening, everyone. Label, that was by far and above the best introduction to a food talk I've ever given. <laughs> I, I, I hope you were listening. I, I really think Label's touched on something of extreme importance, actually. This, this whole thing to do with the attitude and the um, manner in which we actually eat. And touching on the fact that when we, when we, when we, when we eat anything, if we recognise its sacred nature and the fact that whatever we eat has some uh, uh, life force associated with it, um, if we recognise that and we honour that, then I think so many of the problems around food that are really creating so much havoc in our society today would be uh, fixed. Uh, so I, I would encourage you not to um, pass too lightly over what Label said. I imagine if you haven't heard those notions before, uh, they might be quite challenging. Uh, but I would suggest they would be really useful to contemplate, to actually uh, spend some time sitting quietly with yourself and think over uh, the words that uh, Label offered by way of introduction to tonight's talk. Um, and um, it takes me back to the time when I had my leg amputated. Uh, which was back in 1975 uh, and at the time I was a young veterinarian uh, and I worked in Bacchus Marsh which is a rural area uh, and I was very interested in things that moved quickly. I was an athlete at that time and uh, so I was interested in horses and uh, dogs and anything that could sort of run uh, and it used to really annoy me actually as a veterinarian to go out and be asked to treat a cow uh, with the knowledge that sooner or later somebody was going to eat it. <laughs> and I just wasn't interested in that. It co totally disinterested me, even though I ate meat uh, myself in those days. And, um, and, and I thought about this as uh, I had a bit of time after I had my leg amputated and I was recuperating. And I, and I was really struck by this notion of eating more consciously, which labels touched on. And I didn't have any uh, Kabbalistic insight to uh, guide me. It just seemed to me that as somebody who was eating something that had uh, a life of its own, there was a responsibility involved. And as it happened, I had a small farm at the time, so, uh, and I had some cows on it, well, I had some steers on it, and some cows, actually. So I identified one of the steers and uh, fattened him up a little, and sent him off to the local butcher. And he came back in a whole lot of freezer bags. And I went to the trouble of getting his hide tanned. Because he had a particular, I, I chose one that had a particularly fine coat because I, I had this in mind. And, uh, and then I brought the hide home and put that on the floor and invited uh, friends to come around for dinner. And I, I must admit, I probably was a bit naughty in retrospect because I wouldn't say anything about where the meat had come from until people, as they always did, commented on how good Nelson, who was the name of this particular beast, <laughs> tasted. 
And I, at that point, I'd say, yeah, well, actually, that's Nelson we're eating tonight. <laughs> and that's his hide on the floor. <laughs> um, I don't know if you can imagine that, but the dinner parties thinned out fairly rapidly. <laughs> uh, and I had to think of other ways of um, honouring what I was eating, in a sense, or keeping it to myself. But I think there's a great value in thinking about where does our food come from, what's happened to it, how's it been treated. Uh, and there's so much that's good in the Jewish tradition that does have these very good laws laid out around all these things that uh, can help uh, to act as uh, good guidance. Uh, and I, I would think many people could uh, learn from them. Um, so Labels asked me to talk about uh, food, and I know this is part of a series, uh, with a bit of luck you've been meditating a bit and getting de-stressed so you can handle talking about food. <laughs> who, who gets a bit stressed out when it comes to thinking about what they're eating? Who, who feels really clear about what they're eating? Who feels they really know what good food is? So what brought you here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> oh, curiosity, great. <laughs> uh, okay, um, I find there's a, a huge amount of neurosis around food. Uh, I would imagine we all know people, probably nobody close to us, that um, eats out of emotional needs, eats peculiar things when they're under pressure, uh, finds that stress manifests itself in um, the volume of chocolate that's consumed or the amount of coffee that's drunk. Uh, all sorts of things like that. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm not really going to spend much time on this, on that side of it uh, tonight. I think we've probably all got a, a good sense of it. Uh, I'm, I'm really more interested in how we can actually make friends with our food. And I think this is a really good I idea. It's sort of uh, linked to what uh, Label was saying by way of his introduction, is how we can feel really at peace and at ease with what we're eating and, and to make friends with our food. So like, like our food becomes a good friend, you know, somebody that you look forward to um, being with, somebody that you know you can rely upon, somebody that know, you know that's got your best interest at heart, uh, and somebody who's going to be actually useful for you through the good times and the difficult ones. You know, if you are ill, we'll actually come around and support you and help you nurse you back to good health. Uh, because I think that, to my mind, from what I hear from people, a lot of people have quite fractured relationships with their food. Uh, sometimes a bit schizophrenic, sometimes a bit neurotic, uh, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Uh, and it's such an important part of our life. To feel at peace with our food, I think, is a, a major way of getting rid of stresses. Um, and there's no doubt that good food will actually help you in all aspects of your life, including how you manage uh, stress. You might be interested to know, just by way of some of these interesting statistics, um, prisons, there's the opportunity to feed people um, what you like. Uh, and somebody was able to um, persuade a prison to feed the inmates of this particular prison in the States, you know, whole, base, whole foods, like a, a, a fairly highly plant-based whole food type diet. Uh, and they found without changing anything else, the recidivism rate, which is the rate at which prisoners go back into prison after they've been released, dropped dramatically just through the dietary change in, in the actual prison itself. And there's lots of examples like that of how food actually affects people's state of mind, their moods and all sorts of things. Um, I imagine one of the things that brings you to this uh, wonderful centre uh, that Label and his family and all the people who support him have uh, put together uh, is the opportunity to meet like-minded people. Uh, and I imagine there's probably people in the room you know. Uh, maybe you're here for the first time, you don't know too many people, but even if you've been here numerous times, with a bit of luck, there's somebody nearby that you haven't met yet. So I'm going to suggest in a moment that what would be nice is if everybody were to stand up and look around, find somebody you haven't met yet and introduce yourself. People like to know which part of the neighbourhood you've come from. Um, and what I'd ask you to do is just share with this person, be a bit adventurous, share with them something about what you eat that you're, you're interested in improving or changing or doing differently. 
And, and if, if you're really content with what you're eating now, there's nothing like that that uh, stands out. Share with them what you really like, what, what, what it is about the way that you're eating that uh, really, you really enjoy. So something you want to change, something you want to improve, or something you really like about what you're eating the way you are at the moment. So if you'd like to join me in that, stand up, find somebody you haven't met yet, introduce yourself, a little bit of a sharing. Okay, good, well, there'll be some chance to stay back afterwards, I guess, and keep the conversations going. Um, this uh, cycle of um, talks has been a lot about um, dealing with stress, and I guess everybody these days is pretty aware uh, how much potential meditation has to help us with that. So it'd be nice just to take a few moments to relax, let go a bit of the busyness of the day, uh, and just settle into the evening a bit more. So can I suggest, um, we'll just do this for a couple of minutes, but if you've got something on your lap, it might be nice just to pop it on the floor for a moment, if that's easy for you, just so that you won't be disturbed. And then it's good to sit just as upright as your back's comfortable. Might help to push your backside back into the chair a little. Uh, you can lean back a little. Just feel the support from the back of the chair. Probably works best to have your feet just flat on the floor, a little apart. And probably just having your hands cupped lightly on your lap or on your thighs. And just notice what works best for you and then when you're ready, you might like to join me for a few moments and just let your eyes close gently. And it's probably helpful just to have that conscious sense of letting go of the day, all that's been going on through this day. Just to be aware of the simple fact that you're here in this particular place at this particular time. Probably helpful to be reminded there's nowhere else you need to be right now. Nothing else that you need to be doing. No one else that you need to be pleasing or satisfying. It's just this time to be sitting quietly. And it might be helpful just to bring your attention lightly to your breath. And just as simply as as you're breathing in, just notice that you're breathing in. So it's like with a gentle curiosity. You just notice what it's like to be breathing in. So you'll probably notice some subtle movements in the body as you breathe in. If you pay closer attention, you might even notice some subtle sensations as you breathe in and you can feel the breath coming in through your nostrils. Have a sense of the breath going down through the back of your throat, down into the lungs, filling your lungs. And then as you breathe out, that sense of the Breath coming back up through the lungs and out through the nostrils into the space in front of you. And just allowing your breath to take up whatever rhythm feels comfortable for you at the moment. Quite effortlessly. effortlessly. And if you listen closely, you might even notice 
some subtle sounds coming from the breath. Again, just simply noticing. A bit like an impartial observer, just simply noticing. And then if you take your attention to that point up between the eyes, a little into the forehead, you might notice there what's like a point of stillness, like a still, quiet centre. Some it might seem a bit like that space behind the closed eyelids, point of stillness. So relax your eyes, relax your gaze, and just holding your attention lightly on that point of stillness, between the eyes a little into the forehead. It's like you can just rest in that stillness for a few moments. Quite effortlessly. Effortlessly. Just going with it. More and more. Deeper, deeper, just simply letting go. Letting go. I'm just resting quietly for a few moments now. That's good. Good. Good when you're ready now. Just let your eyes gently open again. (coughs) 
So you might like just have a little stretch while you're sitting there. So as I said, I thought it might be useful to explore this notion of uh, how we can make better friends with our food tonight. And probably one of the most useful ways to start with that is to think about who it is that tells us what we're going to eat. Yeah, a few people pointing to their wives. <laughs> that works pretty well in my household. <laughs> Uh, Ruth does a lot of the cooking, I do some. But it's an interesting thing to think about this, like how do you decide what's good food? You know, how do you decide uh, which of all the different foods out there that you are going to make friends with and then, uh, invite home for dinner? Uh, and essentially there are two choices. You either go to some external sort of source of information or authority or you look uh, inwardly. So let's just examine the idea of um, asking somebody from the outside to tell you what to eat. Uh, and it's interesting actually because there's just been some uh, research published uh, quite uh, recently that suggests that many of the people in the Australian public actually look to their doctors for their nutritional information. Um, which is a bit to me like asking a plumber about neuroscience. Um, you know, you might be lucky, but if you, if you ask a doctor that's gone through standard medical training, like my wife did, Ruth went through six years of uh, medical training at Sydney Uni, which is a fairly reputable uh, institution. Some would say quite highly reputable. Uh, six years of training. Do you want to guess how many specific lectures on nutrition they had? Yeah, it's not even one, it was zero. Um, I find this quite remarkable. Uh, it seems to me that in, in um, medical education, the oversight when it comes to nutrition is extraordinary. I've got a daughter who's just started fifth year of veterinary science, uh, following her dad's footsteps, which makes him pretty happy, because uh, we can chat about these things, because I've worked as a vet for a long time now. Uh, but in her training, she's had four full semesters on nutrition. And they study seven different species of animal. And I just wonder what's so different about this human body. That means that nutrition doesn't count. It just seems to be absurd. So if you're interested in asking a doctor, it's really worth asking if they've done any postgraduate training. Because otherwise, their nutritional Knowledge probably comes out of the Women's Weekly or I don't know where they got it. <laughs> and w one of the things I was hoping to do this evening, and I'll show you some things on a PowerPoint later on, is to just talk about some of the myths that, uh, that exist um, that, are, that are clearly not uh, right but uh, can get perpetuated through the community just through lack of good uh, information. Uh, so if you go to dietitians, in my view, um, I think dietitians represent the food industry really well. And when you look at the advice that they give, I think it's heavily flavoured by the food industry and the way they like to make money out of turning basic raw ingredients into things that we'll pay more money for. Just as a, a, a tip, I think one of the best ways to eat well at home is to start every meal with raw ingredients. And then you know what's gone into your food and you haven't allowed other people to mess it around too much. Um, if you go to a, a naturopath, there are some naturopaths that are extremely well trained in nutrition and some that haven't got a clue. Uh, I guess one of the things we would like to think about our doctors is that they're trained to a high level and that's true in so many areas, but in nutrition, it's, you know, the average doctor, it's not very true. Um, Naturopaths have a huge range of training uh, and um, so you have to be quite wary about that. If you get a good one, they can be extremely good. And uh, we went, Ruth and I went to a conference last year with a lot of naturopaths there and they, their nutritional knowledge was really impressive. It was, it was remarkable. I was, 
I thought they might have known a bit. They knew a lot. I was amazed. Uh, I was amazed at the quality of the um, the presentations that were being made. So that 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 area is a little vexed in itself. Like, who can you actually trust for your information? Uh, and so then you think about, well, what's the evidence around what's good to eat? And it's important that when we talk about evidence in medical matters, that we realise that evidence comes from two sources. It comes from, like, medical journals, your own experiments and, and formal research. But evidence also comes from clinical experience. And actually, it's suggested, and I think it's probably a pretty good figure, that about three quarters of what's done in standard medical practice is based on clinical experience, and about a quarter has actually a good research evidence base to support it. And one of the things that, again, I find a little perplexing is some of the people who get very excited about evidence-based medicine currently in medicine suggest that everything should have a research base or we shouldn't do it. Well, that would rule out about three quarters of what's happening in medicine currently. And so we have to have a perspective on this. Um, the Tibetans have a lovely saying. The Tibetans say, an old patient is often more used than a young doctor. <laughs> if you think about that, you know, somebody who's been through something and who's had to actually experience it from the inside, as it were, often has a lot of useful and practical information uh, to share. Whereas somebody who's coming straight out of a research background or sort of a, you know, just a, a, a theoretical background, uh, often hasn't worked out how these things actually apply so uh, directly in practice. So I think the fact of the matter is, from what I observe, some people really like to have an external authority, and I think that's fine as long as you actually choose wisely. You know, if you get a good person and you're prepared to say, well, look, this whole food thing's quite complex. There's so many different points of view. I've got to do something, so I'll put my confidence in you. And you pick somebody who warrants your confidence, then that's not a bad idea. And in some ways, that can be quite simple because they might give you a list and say, well, you eat this stuff and you don't eat that. And if you go home and you take that, then it's pretty simple. I would imagine many people these days would rather think, well, actually, I'm interested in what other people say, but I really want to make up my own mind. Is anybody here like that? A few nodding heads. Who's not sure? <laughs> Okay, so if, if we're going to work out food for ourselves, how do we do it? Because I'm sure you've all seen different reports in newspapers or you know, on the TV or in talking with friends. Some people say, you know, soy foods are really great. They've got all these good things going for them. Others say, oh, no, they'll kill you. They'll give you breast cancer. If you've got breast cancer, it'll speed up your death and all sorts of things like that. Some people say multivitamins are wonderful. Others say, oh, no, they're really bad. They take years off your life. Um, and you can find good stuff in the research for both those arguments I've put forward. They're not just sort of people making up stories. There's research to back up both sides of those two arguments I've just put forward for you already. So some people say, well, there's, there's, how do you sort that out? So I don't know if you write, like, in, write, like writing things down. This might be helpful because one of the things with something like tonight is, if you're like me, who's got a photographic memory? Very good. Come. So if you've got really good... Ruth went through medicine without taking any notes. You've got a very good oral memory. And I had to write everything down. You know, if I find if I don't write something down in a lecture, you know, I just have to ask somebody at the end, what was that all about? Um, so if you like to write some things down, what I've aimed to do tonight is just to highlight a few of these key sort of principles to help you um, sort some of this out. Oh, don't worry. I don't know yet. So just to be clear about this, if, you, if you're aiming to sort out what to do for yourself, then I think it really is very useful 
to actually learn about food. I think there's no doubt that knowledge is useful and there's no doubt that looking into, just take the soy and the multivitamin argument, if you look into that, I think you can get a good sense from the literature what the right answer is and I'll tell you later. Um, so I think knowledge is really useful. But one of the things I've found is, and it's, it's actually really tricky, because um, I've been running groups for over 30 years, one of the things I found really disturbing about these groups was they, people that came to them tended to be different. It's a little inconvenient, but it just seems to be a fact. Like, if, if, if everybody was the same, this would be easy. You know, I could sit up here and I'm sure I could have a list and I could say, look, if you eat, all eat this same thing, everybody will be fine. But that's a bit like Label saying, well, he's really glad everybody came tonight and um, he's feeling particularly generous and he thought to reward you for coming tonight, he wanted to give you a pair of shoes when you left. But as you can imagine, having to come up with a hundred different pairs of shoes different sizes was a little inconvenient. So we took an average and we thought nine and a half would do. And then we thought about colours and well, you know, like having to have half a dozen colours to pay, pander to people's tastes was a bit inconvenient. So we thought brown would be the best. So when you leave, there's a size nine and a half pair of brown shoes waiting for you. Good luck. Who happens to wear nine and a half size shoes? You're in luck. <laughs> So the rest of you are going to have a bit of a squeeze <laughs> or you're going to be a bit floppy. Now, I have to tell you that was a story because I did a talk like this a little while ago and a lady came up to me at the end of the evening and she was looking a bit funny but she came up to me and she said, I was a bit late getting out of the room and all the shoes had gone. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't think I can help you. <laughs> oh, dear. It's a true story. <laughs> uh, but you get the point. So this, this is where food gets complicated. Because what we can do with food is we can talk in broad terms about what works well for most people. But then we have to recognise that people are different. And it's not just that they look different on the outside, but metabolically they're different. And so this is why it's often difficult as an outsider trying to advise somebody what to eat, because you have to know something of their metabolism and how things work for them. And, and so this points to one of the things with food that I think is really useful if you're going into it a little more with a little more awareness and trying to really sort it out well for yourself, is that you often have to experiment a little. And I think it's a really useful notion with food to think that you try things and give them some time and see how they work. But that raises the question then of how do you know when things agree with you? And that I would suggest to you is one of the really important things to sort out. And once you work that out, then the whole food thing becomes easy. So this is what I'd suggest to you. With the knowledge that you can gather, you can sort out what works well for most people. And that's like setting what I would call healthy boundaries. It's sort of like the list of things I eat and the things I don't eat. And I imagine most of you have got those now. I mean, some of you probably eat any old thing. <laughs> Joys of being an omnivore. But most of you, I imagine, think, oh, well, I eat that stuff, but I don't eat that stuff. Right? So that, that's the general list, and that sort of gets you into safe territory if you've actually worked out a good list. And that, that sort of um, healthy guidelines, if you like, or healthy boundaries, is what I've summarised on the sheet that I hope you've all got. Uh, if you didn't get one, there's some more of them here. But this, this um, uh, wellness diet... That, that's that sort of, think of that as like the healthy boundaries. So on that there's a shortish list of things that you're best to avoid and then it talks about the things that are good to concentrate on. And I, and I won't dwell on the detail of that 
tonight because we could spend a day on it easily enough. It's good just to have it summarised there and you can have a look at it. And, and it, it, if nothing else, it'll prompt you to rethink and clarify your own list. But to my mind, if everybody ate that way, we'd reduce cancer probably by 30%. Uh, we'd reduce heart disease significantly. If people weren't smoking and didn't drink too much, it would probably be twice that with cancer. Uh, it, would, it would almost do away with type 2 diabetes. Uh, MS would be cut down to almost nothing. It would really, Alzheimer's I think would be dramatically uh, reduced by it. It would cut down on all the chronic degenerative diseases, all the things you don't want to get, that eating that way will help you avoid it. And you'll feel good. So if, if you want to keep it simple, you could just follow that list and you'd be in pretty safe territory. The, the next step in this, which is where you try to personalise what you're eating, that's a bit more involved. So what I'd suggest to you is that, that that sort of knowledge of what's in general terms good to eat and good to avoid is pretty simple. And you could show that to anybody and I reckon they'd say that's a pretty good list. You know, I've showed it to lots of people and there's whatever sort of training background you come from, most people will say, yeah, that's a pretty good list. From there, if you want to be more particular and, and, and get a, a, another level of benefit, have better friends, if you like, be more intimate with your food, the thing is to work out what suits you as an individual. Uh, and there's a number of ways that you can do that. The first one is to increase your own physical sensitivity or reactivity to what you eat. In other words, to become more sensitive in a physical sense. And how you do that is you actually get rid of the rubbish out of your system. If you think about this, if you're trying to measure how good something is for you, if you're trying to take a measurement, as it were, if you've got a dirty measurer, like imagine if you're trying to measure how long something is, and you've got a ruler, and it's covered in dirt and grime, it's very hard to get an accurate measurement. You, know, you wash it off, clean it up, and then you've you actually got a pretty good chance. I think one of the problems that we have these days is that people are eating so many foods that have been adulterated in one way or another, their body's under so much pressure from that, it's lost its sensitivity. So you eat something that's not very good for you and your body just thinks, oh God, here it goes again. Whereas if your body was in a purer state and you eat something that's not good for you, it notices it. So this takes us back to this old, very old, naturopathic type principle, and I'm sure it was in medicine for quite a while too, it's coming back into vogue a great deal, of detoxifying or purifying your system. You know, and all the great spiritual traditions talk about the benefits of purification, and in this physical sense, it's got a real value as well, because once you do that, you start to notice much more specifically what agrees with you. Oh, yeah, I eat that and I feel good, and I eat something else, and it doesn't feel good. And if you're feeling well within yourself, then you just naturally say, well, why wouldn't I do the stuff that's good for me? So that raises the next question, is what sort of pollution are you getting from your emotions or your mind? And we sort of touched on that earlier. When people have got difficult emotions, that can affect the way they eat dramatically. So the next thing is that, that helps us to actually become more aware and more uh, sensitive, more attuned to what's good for us and what's not when we come to eating things, is to actually get our mind into a good shape. <laughs> and the first thing is to sort of get rid of those unhelpful emotions as much as possible. You know, and again, one of the obvious ways to do that is through meditation. And who's done some meditation before? Yeah, who's completely new to meditation? Okay, few, good, great. Um, who who um, sort of in the last couple of weeks has been meditating regularly? And who in the last couple of weeks feels like I would have liked to have done more meditation than I actually did? 
Probably lots, I imagine. Yeah? Okay. So, one of the things, one of the, this is something for those of you who've been meditating for a while and, and, and find it difficult to keep at it. I think one of the problems with meditating regularly is it makes you more aware. And in the busy lives we lead, it makes us more aware of compromises and things like that that we're having to make. And so part of sustaining a practice of meditation is working out how to integrate, be more relaxed, more calm, more clear, and more comfortable with your life. It's almost like making friends with your life. And I would suggest to you that some people start to meditate, notice, oh, I'm becoming more aware of what's going on around me, and drop the meditation because they can't handle it. You can think about that for yourself. Um, but the same thing happens with food. When you, when you actually meditate more, it heightens your awareness and you start to notice much more clearly what, what it is that agrees with you and what doesn't agree with you. And so this whole thing of becoming more personally attuned or more uh, personally aware of the foods that you're eating actually gets sped up. So if you put those together, it becomes fairly simple. You get the best information you can. You know, it's really useful to read some books on this. Uh, I'll give... I'll actually, Ruth, give me one book. <laughs> I've just republished um, You Can Conquer Cancer. I've rewritten it. And I first wrote this in 84. Uh, and for many people, it's a fairly strident title, You Can Conquer Cancer. And so you have to realise this book's nearly uh, 30 years old. And 30 years ago, even more than today, people got cancer and they thought they were going to die. Uh, and so I sort of believed that people could recover and I wanted to... Oh, it's okay. I, I wanted to um, help them to break that sort of you know, myth, if you like, or that conditioned way of thinking. Um, and, and perhaps if it was a um, softer title in that way, uh, people would... Um, recognize more clearly that it's actually the best way to conquer cancer is not to get it best way to treat cancer actually is not to get it ask anybody who's got it and and the fact is it's a highly preventable illness you know which is a bit disconcerting for those of us who've got it um, uh, you know like I did and you think about well how did I come to get it but if you investigate that you find that most of the causes of cancer are lifestyle related and diet's the number one so this is something we can really do uh, uh, quite a lot about and so in, in this rewritten uh, edition of the book uh, there's a lot of explanation there's a lot of knowledge there uh, that I've gathered over the years. Uh, so I talk about, you know, why, why recommend a low pro you know, relatively low protein diet? You know, why, why flaxseed oil is far better for you than uh, sunflower oil? You know, what the rationale behind that is and explain all those things. And I and I'd hope you'll find that the way it's set out now, it's really accessible and uh, useful. Uh, so I'd encourage you, if you're interested in food, that that's, it is a good place to get that basic information because a lot of that stuff I've been gathering over years and I, I don't know another, of another book apart from my friend George Jelinek, or is, Jelinek who's written a similar book on MS um, where that sort of information is gathered together. Um, so, yes, if you've got MS, you can get that book from the Foundation. Um, so, it starts with good information, then it's like getting onto a fairly pure, simple, clean diet. And, and you can do that sort of detoxifying, purifying of your body gradually just by eating well over months, or you can do it more rapidly with a sort of more specific detoxing type program, which is, there's one outlined in my book and quite a lot of natural therapists would help you with that. There's other books written specifically on that. And it's interesting, a lot of the magazines these days are full of ideas about how to detox and purify and all that sort of stuff. It's very coming into vogue, which is rather fun, because it's really useful. It really is very useful. And then there's this idea of actually developing your food awareness. So we're going to do a little exercise to help you with this, and if a couple of people wouldn't mind helping over here, perhaps some of you... 
we've got this really exotic fruit. Now, what I want you just to suspend your memory for a minute and imagine that what's coming around is this really exotic thing to eat that's incredibly precious. And you just take one. So have a good look at the little tray that's coming around. Just don't take the first one that comes to mind. Have, have, a, have a good look. Choose one that you think looks really good to you. Actually, Label, can I have one in passing, please? Okay, so, so the idea is that what's coming around, um, perhaps you can imagine that there's just been a um, spaceship come back from Mars and rather than just being the red hot burning planet, they found there were things growing there. And actually there was this little fruit. And this spaceship came back. Yeah, don't eat it. Hang on to it. Thank you. Hang on to it. If you've eaten it, ask for another one. You've had a sneak preview. <laughs> Yeah, so you don't want to rush this because this is really precious. This is like opening a bottle of Grange or, um, I don't know, having whatever fantasy of a meal you have. This is like something really special. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is, is go into silence for a minute. I know this is always difficult with Jewish audience. I <laughs> hope that's not a racist comment, but... <laughs> I've been around this before. <laughs> okay, keep quiet for a minute and give your attention to this little fruit. Okay? Now, imagine this is like, this is priceless. Somehow we managed to luck out and we got enough so that everybody gets one. And look at this as if you've never seen one. You, you probably think you know what this is and you're familiar with it. But just try and suspend all that, give it your full attention and look at it as if you've never seen it and you want to find out everything you can about it. So that means you look at it from every angle. You take the time to roll it around between your thumb and your fingers. You might squeeze it a little, get a sense of its texture. You might even like to see what it smells like. Yeah, quiet. I know it's difficult. Shh. Concentrate. Okay, and, and in a moment, what we're going to do is actually we're going to get to eat one of these things. So we don't want to rush it, okay? You want to take it really slowly. So when you do, in a moment, go to eat it, you want to be conscious of actually putting it in your mouth. And then when you put it in your mouth, don't bite into it. That would be too quick. Take your time, roll it around, see what tastes you can notice. See what texture you notice. So when you can do, and, and then when you feel really ready, then you can perhaps bite into it or you roll it around. See what you can notice with it. Okay, so when you're ready, in your mouth, roll it around. If it helps to focus your attention, you can close your eyes. So it's like you're giving this thing your full attention, which means you're not talking, you're quiet. And then when you've explored it as fully as you can with your teeth and your tongue, perhaps rolled it around your lips or your cheeks, you might like to just gently bite into it. Notice what happens. Notice where the flavours register, whether it's the front of the mouth or the back or the middle. You can notice what's happening with your saliva. If you take your time, just notice how long Remnants of this exotic fruit stay in your mouth.
And then when you start to swallow some of it, notice where the flavour goes. Perhaps then you find little bits wandering around your mouth. Okay. Anybody got any observations? What do you notice? Yep. Tastes like chocolate. Tastes like chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> right there, the lady up the back. Mm. Yeah, normally you take a handful of sultanas. It's a pity these, in, this, in America, these things are called raisins, and then it's a conscious, consciousness raisin exercise. But yeah, sultanas, yeah, I mean, you usually take a handful, don't you? And you just sort of bolt them down, and it's like, oh, what was that? One of the things I notice when I do this so slowly is it, 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 there's something satisfying about it. You, you, if you, you hadn't had anything to eat for a while, you'd, you'd feel much more satisfied just from a simple sultana eaten so slowly. What about the gentleman here? I just to Yeah, yeah, it lingers on a long time after something like this, doesn't it? Yep. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And also, I feel like I've had a whole meal. Yeah, yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> well, the... the <laughs> No, I agree. I, that's what I was saying. I think that can be quite satisfying. And it's one of the problems when we eat quickly. Th this has actually got some grounding in physical fact because satiety has got to do a lot with the brain as well as the stomach. So what makes us feel full is somewhat to do with the stomach, but it's a lot to do with the brain. So if we do something deliberate and slow like that, that actually satisfies the satiety centre in our head and we don't feel like we have to eat so much. Yeah. It just tied me out. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it really is interesting that. So, so in fact, what that exercise is, is like a exercise in really bringing mindfulness to your food. And it was one of the things I noticed coming out of or progressing through my illness, actually, is that the more I ate mindfully like that, the easier it was to gauge whether a food was actually good for me personally or not. And it really helped me to go from sort of general recommendations to specific ones. And there weren't a lot of variations, but it just, I just felt I got a lot of benefit out of, get, of those, sort of that sort of tweaking of it, if you like. Um, so I'll leave that with you as a, as a possibility. Um, and, and really it's something that, you know, if you do from time to time and sit down and aim to have a more deliberately mindful meal, it, it can really be very helpful, I think. Yeah, and you know, like if, you, if you think about what can happen around meals at the other end of that pole, you know, I mean, we've, we've taken like the best part of five minutes to eat one sultana. You think about what some people are doing, you know, as they rush around in their busy days. It's nice to balance things out a little. Okay. So this is where I live. And um, I think when it comes to food, it's clear that we're all in this together. And there's no doubt that what's happening with our food is it's price, the way it's being produced in the world today, it's, it's putting intense strain on the, the environment. So if, just as an example, if you grow a, um, a kilogram of protein through soybeans or through beef, you need about 18 to 20 times the cleared land mass to grow the beef. Uh, the beef put out a huge amount of um, the um, gases, the methane. Uh, it's one of the things that's downplayed in the whole uh, discussion around global warming is the huge contribution 
that um, animals raised for food are actually making to, um, the, to the gases. And interestingly, environmentalists are leading the changes that are necessary. So if you think of palm oil, uh, it's a saturated fat, it's in so many things, and it's an absolute disaster for the environment. And curiously, it's the environmentalists, not the dietitians and the doctors, who are, uh, who are putting a lot of pressure on government and um, industry to cut back on the palm oil because it's so hard on the environment. Uh, just to give you a bit of background, this is my chest in 1976. And those things that look a bit like an alien leaping out of my chest are actually um, uh, bone cancer. Uh, some of you might have heard people alluding to the thought that this might have been TB, but it's pretty weird looking TB to me. Um, and most other people that have actually had a look at it properly. Um, and I think one of the amazing things about the body is its capacity to heal. So um, about 18 months later, I was back to a flat chest and uh, that was without having those things which were solid bone surgically removed and i know a flat chest doesn't work well for everybody but it's been pretty good for me <laughs> so i just want to give you an idea of where we're at um, if you're a woman who's 50 or in her 50s you've got a better than 50 ch 50 50 chance of living to be 90. Uh, if you're a guy in your 50s you've got about a one in three chance of living to be 90. And so the big question for a lot of us is what sort of old age are we going to have? And what I'd suggest to you, because of how we're eating, a lot of people are going to have a really tough old age. So there's a couple of women who are starting to work things out. <laughs> my memory really sucks, Mildred, so I changed my wo password to incorrect. <laughs> that way when I log in with the wrong password, the computer will tell me. Your password is incorrect. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, it's just, just not just the memory that uh, suffers a bit. If you look at what's happening with cancer, um, from in the last 10 years that, that we've got figures, uh, the cancer incre has increased about 30%. Uh, a lot of that's because of the ageing population. Uh, some of it's due to the fact we've got more people. Uh, but in cancer, in, in uh, sorry, uh, Australia, 2011, over 120,000 people diagnosed with cancer. Of those, uh, about 45,000, 42,000 will die. It's about 35% uh, in five years. That's just in five years. That keeps sort of going on after that. Uh, and there's over a quarter of a million people living with cancer. And it's just way too many. And it's a preventable illness. You look at heart disease, it's a preventable illness. Type 2 diabetes, it's a preventable illness. MS, it's a preventable illness. So when it comes to food, what do we do? We get excited. <laughs> and I think importantly, this, the bottom line here is to think about how we can actually make some impact on this. Because as a society, we get what we put up with. And that's what they say about our politicians. Uh, I think it, it happens with our medical system uh, and I think it happens with our food. Uh, and Menachem, who many of you all know as um, Label's son, was telling me uh, earlier on today that um, Coles you know, locally has got kosher, uh, kosher food all labelled and set out in the supermarket. And I'm sure that's because people got, got socially active and went to them and said, look, there's a lot of people here who'd eat this stuff and would come to you if they knew where it was. That's social, like, that's what I mean. It's like expressing your views and saying, we don't want this rubbish food. You know, we don't want all this fast food. We don't want all this junk going into our kids. We want things to change. We want to be able to buy good food easily. And if enough people do that, you know, I don't think it takes very many, uh, things will change. Coles, to their great credit, have, have, will only sell organic meat these days. You know, you can question whether they should be selling meat at all if you're a vegetarian, but, you know, the fact that they won't sell meat like the rest of Australia, where there's growth hormones in just about all the beef you buy, they won't do it. And that's changing the, the whole industry because nobody else can, can, can manage it. And that's consumer pressure. 
So I think we really need to get more active. We, we need to get a little bit informed. If you're not so well, food will help you to get well in a major way. And then I think uh, you want to stay well and think about how you can help others. Who's got a home veggie garden? You know, little one, big one, doesn't matter, something. Not very many. Okay, this is one of the best things you can, you can do, really, for environmentally for yourself. It's a great way of getting to know your food, making friends with your food. If you, if you grow a cauliflower from a seedling, or even more wild from a seed, you'll have a lot of respect for it. You'll realise it's not all that easy. You know, there'll be a few things that want to eat it along the way. You know, you'll have to water it. You'll have to look after it. You'll, dis you'll become friends with your cauliflower. I'll, I'll tell you a story. When my kids were little, they we all grew up as vegetarians. I can remember on numerous occasions we'd bring fresh veggies in from the garden. And I, I'm thinking about a cauliflower particularly, actually. It just sort of linked me to it. And I remember one of my daughters looking at the cauliflower sitting on the table before it was going to be prepared for dinner. And she got all sad and she said, oh, look, Daddy, the cauliflower's crying. And it had sap sort of oozing out the end of it because it was so fresh. She could recognise it was a living thing. Okay, so this is the, the paradigm, the way of thinking. It's food as a partner, as a pathway to good health. Food as a therapy which is no doubt it is, very good evidence for it, both from research and clinical experience. And food is something we really enjoy, you know, as this um, good friend. So if we look at uh, what food's capable of doing in terms of preventing illness, I think this is really well known. And this is just one of any number of studies. Uh, this actually comes from the uh, Royal Cancer Research Fund, which is sort of like the pinnacle peak sort of body of cancer research in the world. They looked at 954 studies, big, big meta-analysis, big uh, sort of summary of all this, and they said that you could pre prevent 40% of breast cancers, and most people would see this as probably the most, a very conservative research body, said so at least 40% of breast cancers could be easily um, um, prevented by simply being lean, by exercising 30 minutes a day, by not having more than one alcoholic drink a day and women breastfeeding their babies for six months. And that would help both the mothers and the babies, actually. If you breastfeed a baby for six months, its chances of getting obese are quite small. Um, but a lot of people, when, when you hear uh, medical authorities talking about nutrition and cancer, which is the field I'm interested in, had a lot to do with, say that uh, there's no doubt that uh, food will prevent cancer, but we don't have evidence that it will actually contribute to recovering. Well, that, that's just a lack of um, reading of the information, uh, the research. And this is, a, again, another major meta-analysis where they looked at a, a, a large range of studies and, and, and it's couched in that sort of conservative medical terms. Observational studies suggest a low-fat, high-fibre diet might be protective against cancer, in other words, from getting it. Um, sorry, cancer recurrence and progression. This is actually after you've had initial breast cancer treatment. So this is a, this is a conservative statement saying it's probably likely. And there's, more, there's no doubt, I don't think, uh, that physical activity will reduce the risk of dying of breast cancer after you get it. Yes, yeah. So this is some of the things that we know that affect women who've had uh, primary breast cancer. If you're a healthy weight, you've almost got half the chance of secondaries to care compared to somebody who's obese and got um, early breast cancer. So one of the best things that women with breast cancer can do is to lose weight if they're overweight. Uh, if you have seven or more alcoholic drinks a week, it almost doubles the risk of getting cancer in the opposite breast. But what, what a lot of these risk factors do, and we know this in terms of the preventive side, 
or the, or the causative signs, but also once you've got cancer, is that they act synergistically. So if you smoke and drink at the same time, the risk of getting cancer in the opposite breast goes up by about seven times. So they, they potentiate, they're synergistic, they multiply, they have a multiplying effect. I want to introduce you to a couple of new terms and a few ideas that are really helpful to understand. And, and this is a, probably a word you mightn't have heard much about, which is meta-inflammation. And meta-inflammation is chronic, low-level inflammation. And I think a lot of our kids have got it which relates to their allergies and all sorts of other things that they get, and a lot of adults get it. And it's clear that the average way that people are eating is a major inducer or driver of this meta-inflammation. Now, what that, that, having chronic low-level inflammation in your system means that you get a whole range of chemicals which you know, we could go into if we had more time or we wanted to be more scientific about it. But these are well known and those chemicals actually aggravate the chronic degenerative diseases. So if again we take cancer as an example, we know that if you, if you have that chronic low level inflammation, you're more likely to get cancer. And it's very clear if you've got cancer and you've got low level inflammation, that inflammation will aggravate the cancer and speed it up. This is why you might have heard, if you're interested in the cancer field, people are recommended to pay really good attention to their gum, their mouth, the, the health of their mouth to avoid inflammation of the gums, if you've got root canals to get them attended, because that sort of low-level infection, just of that nature, can actually quite clearly aggravate uh, cancer. So we need to be very careful about that. Um, and one of the things that the diet that we talk about, and particularly combined with the meditation, is particularly good at doing is cutting down inflammation. So that diet that's summarised for you could be characterised as highly anti-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory and highly regenerative. And that's why it's good in the whole range of chronic degenerative diseases. So a lot of people are into fast food these days and it's clear that it's really bad news. If somebody has um, colon cancer, cancer of the bowel, and they eat a whole lot of fast food, junk food, they're three times more likely to get a recurrence after initial treatment, and they're three times more likely to die of the disease. Now, this is research that came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association, one of the premium journals of the world in 2007. So when I hear doctors saying, it doesn't matter what you eat once you've got cancer, it just tells me that they're not reading in the right area before they say things like that. Uh, a lot of people are interested in pills. There's been a lot of discussion around whether multivitamins, for example, are actually good or bad for you. Uh, and in fact, the Cancer Council uh, put out a um, statement on this just uh, a couple of days ago, and I think I was on the project tonight. <laughs> uh, didn't get to see it. Did you see me? I was there, was I? Yeah, I was interviewed yesterday. How did I look? How did I look? Handsome, that's what I like. Oh, I hope she got a free ticket, this lady. <laughs> <laughs> they might have it online. They usually stream those things. I'll be interested to see what I... Editing those things is so unpredictable, what they say. Anyway, this is, a, again, in JAMA just at the end of last year. So this is very recent. Uh, they're looking at uh, multivitamins and how it affected the risk of developing or dying of cancer. There's a big trial conducted over 11 years, lots of people... Uh, thought to be a well-conducted uh, study. It showed that uh, taking multivitamins regularly seemed to have no impact one way or another on prostate cancer. Um, there was a 12% ri risk reduction in total for developing all other cancers. So in other words, if you took a multivitamin regularly, it seemed to reduce your risk, reduce your risk of getting cancer by 12%. Um, and it showed a 12% reduction in the risk of dying from cancer, but that didn't 
have statistical significance. It's an observation, but in statistical terms, they, they can't put a lot of weight on, but it's in the right direction. It, it certainly is opposite to what a lot of people with cancer get told by their doctors that you shouldn't take multivitamins, it'll interfere with things and create problems. Yeah, that's always a good question with these studies. Um, sure. Sure. I, uh, you can, if you take Gaziano and Jama and vi multivitamins, I, I haven't actually looked into that level of detail with it. Um, but it, it, you're right. I mean, with all this research, it's very interesting. But here's another one from 2011. Um, which again looked at multivitamins and this time just specifically with breast cancer. Uh, it showed that they, it, it concluded that they weren't harmful and it improved outcomes with radiation uh, or radiation chemotherapy. It seemed like it really protected against uh, the damage that comes with radiation and improved outcomes. Uh, and they found in this study that consistent multivitamins use before and after diagnosis, eating more fruits and vegetables, as well as being more physically active, is so associated with better overall survival. I mean, in my own view and my own conclusion, when it comes to nutrition, there's no doubt about what's best, and that's food. And so, if you want to, uh, you want to use food therapeutically. The first thing, or nutrition therapeutically, the first thing is to get the food right. I think the next thing that's really useful is to consider using juices because they concentrate vitamins and minerals and nutrients in, a, in a, a naturally balanced way. And then I think supplements, and I think herbs have got a real part to play too. I think herbs can be really useful. Probably put them above supplements as well. Uh, this is tofu. Uh, so there's been a lot of debate about tofu. I mentioned the whole soy thing. Uh, if you're interested in this, I think this is the best review article I've seen. I've read a lot on this talked to lots of people about it. I actually think soy is safe. Uh, there's little doubt it's useful from a preventive point of view. Uh, and I think even uh, with women with breast cancer, to my mind, it's uh, much more of a plus. Uh, and I would feel I've been recommending it for, for years. Um, so that, that review article in uh, 2008, um, I think is the most measured one. And certainly in soy, there's, there's a, definitely a turf war going on with dairy industry where they um, trade uh, research. This, this is an independent study that looks at the whole range of it. And there's also good soy products. Yeah, you have to be selective about which soy milks you use and things like that. Um, the cows are all, all for soy milk. <laughs> this is one of my favourite posters. I love this. Eat more chicken. <laughs> Um, that raises the whole question of uh, milk uh, and as the years have gone on I've become more confident of suggesting you're better off avoiding dairy products as adults and probably even as kids. Uh, there's a com pretty uh, compelling study came out of uh, the Scandinavia last year. Uh, they looked at uh, boys and the level of uh, milk consumption they had at boys and the rates of prostate cancer in uh, those boys when they became men they found there was a very uh, strong correlation between the amount of milk consumed in um, childhood uh, with the rates of prostate cancer as men. I think there's lots of reasons, I'll go into it in the book, I think there's lots of reasons why we're better off avoiding dairy products. Goat's milk's got um, a shorter molecular protein, so from the, from the point of view of creating inflammation, which is what cow's milk can do pretty easily, it's better off, but then it's a saturated fat, and you can't actually separate the fat so easily out because it's, it's naturally homogenised. So I, th I think you're better off using, I think going without milks or, or using the substitute. Rice milk, soy milk, yeah. But soy milk you've got to be particular about, and I think Bonsoy had troubles a few years ago with the iodine kerfuffle, uh, but when they've got that sorted out, which I think they have now, I think it's the best of them. And there's some very bad soy milks that you wouldn't want to drink. 
Who knows what almond milk's fine? Who knows who this is? Recognise? Nobel, Nobel Prize, yep. Getting warmer? No. It's Elizabeth Blackburn, most recent uh, Australian to win a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, Nobel <laughs> Medicine Prize. Meds <laughs> Prize for Medicine. Do you know what she got it for? Telomeres. Telomeres. Okay, who knows what a telomere is? Okay, this is something I might be able to help you with tonight because you're going to hear heaps more about these. Telomeres are like the dangly bits on the end of your DNA. Right, so if that's DNA, there's double helixes, and on and when they come to reproduce, so your cells can uh, reproduce, those double helixes have to separate and then they rejoin. And when they do that, they tend to fray. And to stop that fraying, at the end they have these telomere things called telomeres, and the telomeres fray and try and protect the actual DNA. But as time goes on, the telomeres get shorter and shorter. And short telomeres, so this is what it looks like, that this is the DNA, like the, the cycles, and the telomeres are the things at the end. And as your telomeres get shorter, everything gets worse, basically. You become more likely to get any of the chronic degenerative diseases. There's a whole lot of illnesses that are now known to be linked to shorter telomeres. And so there's a big quest on in medicine to find out what can actually protect our telomeres or lengthen them. And we know a few things that do it already. So I've talked about that. And we've talked about that. In the cancer field, short telomeres are associated with both a higher risk of getting cancer and if you get cancer and you've got shorter telomeres, you're more likely to die. Uh, so it's really very significant. Okay, so we know of several things so far that actually increase telomeres. And one is actually a healthy lifestyle. So this has been actually demonstrated by Dean Ornish, who ran a, a very similar program to what the Gawler Foundation does, like what's in uh, You Can Conquer Cancer. Uh, and they showed that uh, over uh, a three-month period, they improved, improved increased telomere um, levels by 10%. We know that smoking, most of the things you'd think are bad for you actually shorten telomeres. Uh, a lot of the things that are helpful, you'd think of as helpful, vitamin C, D and E, folate have been proven to improve uh, telomeres and omega-3 fatty acids, the flaxseed oil. <coughs> don't know. Don't know. Don't know. I don't know if anybody's studied it yet. Okay, meditation. They uh, Elizabeth Blackburn, you see her name, Blackburn E, crop up on a lot of these uh, studies. She's really um, um, collaborating with a lot of people. This is a mob that did a three-month intensive meditation retreat and they showed that they could improve, they, they increased the telomeres by 30%. I think they were surprised it went up so much. Um, there's specific herbs that do it and this um, thing called Product B has been tested with a whole range of uh, different herbs they put them together synergistically and it seems to work to activate um, telomeres. Uh, if you're interested in that, the, the website there I put together to explain the science around that, it's Herbal TS for Herbal Telomere Support, just .net, and you can have a look at that and you, you can, you're going to get this stuff online. I just want to mention a couple of really other interesting things like turmeric, which is in product B, but you can just buy that and use it in, in, in um, um, like in cooking. It's one of the, or juicing, it's one of the best herbs, um, particularly in the cancer field. Uh, one of the things it does that virtually nothing else that we know of yet does is it actually targets breast cancer stem cells. These are the ones that lay dormant and later pop up as secondaries. And, and, and so something that can actually deal with them is really useful. And turmeric's one of the few things that have been shown to do that so far. Turmeric uh, is much better absorbed and has a much better function if you combine it with pepper. Black pepper. Black pepper. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Do black pepper? I don't think so. No, no. I've talked about peppers in my book, actually, but, there's all, but black pepper's pretty much black pepper, I think. 
Yes, no, the fresh is like good if you can get it, which you can pretty widely in Melbourne, but, but the dried stuff seems to work. A lot of the research has been done with the dried stuff, actually. Um, this is really interesting too. This is a study from 2007 that showed that turmeric both reduced the side effects and increased the benefits of radiotherapy. Uh, pomegranate has a thing called ellagic acid in it, which stops cancer cells from dividing and multiplying. Um, so pomegranate juice has been shown specifically with um, prostate cancer to actually slow down the, the um, progression of prostate cancer significantly. Uh, there's some good trials done on that. This is uh, one that uh, highlights it. Um, slow down the, the progression of uh, prostate cancer by a, a quarter. You know, it really made a big difference. So just we're getting towards uh, summarising, finishing up. What I'd suggest is have a good look at the summary sheet that uh, I've handed out. Uh, it'll give you a lot of uh, good ideas. I think you'll find, if you're really interested, it's worth actually looking at that more detailed information that's in, uh, in my new book. Um, if you've got the old one uh, and you've read that, the new one's actually like a new book. <laughs> I've completely rewritten it, so I, I'd really encourage you to get the new one. Uh, I mean, the royalties won't make a lot of difference to me, but the information might for you. Uh, there's a couple of CDs I've got on food. Uh, there's a book that the foundation I set up, uh, has, they've put out this book called um, Eat Well, Be Well. It's a really good recipe book uh, that's very consistent with what's in You Can Conquer Cancer. Uh, some of you might have had the older recipe books, um, Recipe for Life 1 and 2. Uh, they weren't bad, but this one's way better again. Uh, this has only been out for a few months. You can get that online through the foundation if you're looking for it. Um, getting good help, I think, if you're changing a diet makes a lot of sense. And enjoy it. <laughs> and just finally, I, I think I come back and uh, sort of finish uh, by, by saying I would really encourage you to think about being more socially active around food. Uh, one of the best ways you can help people to change their own food habits is to give them a role model. You know, so getting older and looking good is a good start. Um, it's one of the things that food will do to you. One of the best reasons to eat well is it's great for getting rid of wrinkles. It's true. Um, don't, don't put up with people's stupidity. When people say, oh, I have one of these, it won't matter. What they're actually saying is, if you have one of these, I'll feel better. Right? So you've got to challenge people's stupidity and say, well, no, actually, I rather enjoy looking after myself and I don't think I will have one of those. Thanks very much. And if people get interested in talking to you, you can talk with them more. Uh, if you're interested in doctors that are trained in nutrition, the Australian College of uh, Nutritional Medicine, ACNAM, uh, has a website, as does the Australian Integrative Medical Association. Uh, the first one has, uh, has a really strong focus on nutrition and environmental medicine, obviously, by its title. Uh, and, and they've been running training, postgraduate training in nutrition for doctors. One of the, the things you have to be a little cautious is that they, they, they do give a lot of emphasis to supplements. And as I said, I think food's the real deal. Uh, but they can be useful. You just need the, um, the initials and you'll find them easy enough. Uh, and just while we're finishing off, I'll just say a couple of words and I imagine Label want to have the last word. Um, there's a questionnaire if you'd like to fill that out. Uh, it's nice to get some feedback. Uh, and I write a um, sort of blog newsletter uh, each week. Uh, What's going on? Oh, this week it's about our uh, meditation trip, Ruth and I taking people out into the Central Australian Desert in uh, September. So if you're really interested in meditation, want to go to an extraordinary place to meditate, um, there's some detail on that on the, the blog. Um, and uh, But there's a lot on food around that. Uh, and the foundations there is a great resource uh, for those of you. Um, Have we got time for a couple of questions, Label? Yeah. Just one, okay. You made, a, you made a comment about cancer and prevention and how all these different things help with prevention, but a lot of cancers, like, there's a huge component of cancer that's genetically, that's related to 
related to genetics as well. So are you sort of saying that if you have the gene that's a predisposition for a particular cancer, if you eat in this particular way, then the environmental factors will most probably help not trigger that cancer? Because there's, you know, a lot of cancers are genetic, not just yes. if the food you okay. Thanks for having a nice, clear voice. Yeah, the, what you're saying is absolutely right. Uh, well, you, the, the, the contention that a lot of cancers are genetically related is not so accurate. It's only about 10%. That's the fact of the matter. So I think many people have the notion that it's much higher than that. But the, 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 the evidence from the research, all the medical people say it's about 10% that are closely, dietary, uh, closely genetically related. Another word that I was thinking we could have gone into, but we wouldn't have had time, so I didn't, is epigenetics. Right? So that's another word you'll hear a lot more of, because epigenetics is, how, is to do with how your genes express themselves. And what you're saying is very right. You can have a gene that has a problem with it, but that problem won't be expressed unless the environment's right for it. And by eating well, you can influence your genes dramatically. And that's the whole study of epigenetics. And it's a very rich area of study. And it's very clear that nutrition affects genes both adversely and, and activates genes that otherwise might be dormant or not a problem. And happily, by contrast, you can have problematic genes that with the right environment won't actually express themselves into something that gives you a real problem. So it's a big area, it's an important one. I know there'll be a myriad of questions now, but I also know that a lot of people need to get away and there's always a bit of a tension as to shall I get up and leave or shall I wait to the end? So I'm going to put a lot of people uh, not out of their misery because I'm sure that this was absolutely fascinating. But let me say one thing just in response to the young lady's question there. Uh, refer to Professor Sonia Libomirsky, who notes in her book there that 40% of your life is genetically inclined. That's called your set point. 10% is the result of circumstances or environment. And 40% is volition and free choice. And the point being, which uh, was very well just said a few moments ago, your free choice, your volition, has, is able to alter the genetic set point influences as well as the circumstantial influences. So really you are a free agent, but only if you exercise your free will. And I think that's what we've heard tonight is a range of options on how to exercise your free will. I began this evening by citing uh, the sort of dark Orwellian book, The Day of the Triffids, the author is actually Wyndham, in which plants get theirs back against humans. Well, I think in a way that's what food does. If we don't treat food honorably, the food comes to haunt us or to express itself through us. It's maybe not as active as in that book, but it is subtly absolutely true. Maimonides says there are three aspects, three basic principles, and if you follow these, you will remain healthy for a long age. All to do with food. Quality, quantity, and consciousness. That's what he says. And I think we've heard about quality tonight to a large extent, and we still struggle with it because of the way that the manufacturing industry continually pollutes and toxifies food. So we have to be very much on the lookout for that. Quantity is a terribly important factor. Rambam, Maimonides says, quantity affects us in a very profound way. We tend to overeat and especially have a sedentary life. And the third aspect, consciousness, is not just mindful eating, and I don't say just, because that alone is a major factor, but the kind of mind-emotion set that we have, our balance when we eat, because our mind-emotion balance translates down to the cellular level, the way the body handles the food that we eat. You can have the most healthy regime, but if you are an anxious worrier, you'll still get sick. The food won't solve that. On the other hand, if you're able to handle it at both ends, the consciousness factor of ensuring that you have an optimistic, positive vantage point on life, coupled with pure food, 
Maimonides says you'll lead not just a long life, but a healthy, active life. So there's some very great wisdoms, and I heard echoes of that in tonight's presentation. I'm not surprised, because I think we have in Ian not just an individual who is knowledgeable about the subject, but I always look to a person who's actually lived through crises and is able to share as a consequence of that. You can't beat an existential condition. Therefore, Ian, thank you very, very much for uh, sharing with us again. Um, I noticed that one of the uh, very few chefs who is also a master of the science of health food is in the audience, and that's uh, Rabbi David Trachtman over there. So if you really want to have a healthy kiddush or a healthy uh, simcha, have a word with... Stand up, David. Okay. Uh, really, he really uh, understands. He's gone through the whole science of food as well. Excellent. And I thank you very much. Come on Monday if you want to have a Kabbalistic discussion from an ancient text on de-stressing, which Menachem's going to lead. Come next Wednesday if you want Menachem and myself to lead an evening where we're going to involve ourselves in meditative activity and exercises for de-stressing, coupled with a group discussion on the kind of worries and anxiousness and how to get around it. So I look forward to see you on those occasions. Out there in front, you have a wealth of knowledge in the terms of books and CDs. Please browse, have a look, and I endorse every single one of them from our tradition as well. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.